Welcome back to the Paradigm Project. Today, our guest is Utah House Representative Mike Winder. We'll be talking everything from Constitution to the current housing crisis and his response to COVID-19. Stick around. It's going to be a good one. Representative Winder, what was the first office of government that you ran for? And was that campaign successful? So great question, Dallin. Uh, The first office I ran for was the treasurer of Calvin Smith Elementary in the third grade, and I lost. Sorry to hear that. (laughs) But later on, I I ran for vice president of the seventh grade at Benyon Junior High, and I won. And then I ran for student body president of Benyon Junior High. And not only did I lose, but my two best friends each won their SBO race. And so it was kind of a sad day. (laughs) That's rough. Um, But not to be beaten down, I came back as a junior class senator at Taylorsville High and then as student body president at Taylorsville High. And then as a as an adult, I, I won a race in the West Valley City Council at age 29 to be their youngest council member ever. And then I won a race to be West Valley City Mayor at age 33, their youngest mayor. And then I ran for Salt Lake County Mayor and lost in 2012. And then I ran for the state legislature and won. And I've won that race three times nice. now. So you win some, you lose some, and I've won more than I've lost, so I count myself fortunate. Even Abraham Lincoln lost more races than he won. Dang. So Well, that's super cool. Yeah, it's a great question. Well, we're super glad to have you here, uh, Representative Winder. So my next question would be, why did you get involved in local government? What motivated you to become civically active? Well, I, I care deeply about uh, the community and, and giving back, and in high school, I was in lived in the Benyon area of Taylorsville at the time. And back then, Taylorsville was not a city. It was just an unincorporated part of the county. And I learned through my student government work and talking with some of the county commissioners that Taylorsville was contributing more to the county budget than it was getting back in services. And that didn't seem right. We wanted to preserve our identity as a community. So I I launched the incorporation effort for the city of Taylorsville at, at age 18. And what year is this? That would be 1994, and it, it started, gained some momentum, and honestly, I left on a mission to Taiwan, and my mom picked up the slack as the incorporation co-chair, and Taylorsville is incorporated as Utah's newest city in 1996, but that little taste of that process gave me a bit of a bug for, hey, how can we help make our, our communities a better place? That is fantastic. Sort of like this see a need, fill a need. Yeah. See a need, fill a need. And you don't have to wait until you have gray hairs. Young people can jump in and start changing the world. Well, I guess to lead into that, do I need to run for office or get involved in politics to be a good citizen? And more on that, what do you feel like are our civic duties? First of all, you don't have to be an elected official to make a difference. And you certainly can find ways to make a difference in ways beyond being an elected official. One of my favorite quotes is by Theodore Roosevelt that says, in America, we are the government, you and I. And it's true. We, the people, form the government. And it's not just the elected officials. It's those who support them getting in office or support getting someone else in office if they don't like the direction things are going. And uh, my wife, Karen's a great example. I've seen her involved with uh, school PTAs and community councils. And in her case, that led to a seat on the Granite School Board. And in fact, this year, she's president of the Granite School Board but I saw the great amount of good she did just at the community council and PTA level. And so I encourage people to be involved in their community. My first involvement in West Valley City was not as an elected official, it was as a volunteer. I was on the civic committee and the West Valley Historical Society and sister city committee and uh, helped out in a lot of different ways before I ever ran for elected office. So elective office is one way that people can be involved, but there's so many other ways to get involved even at a young age. I think that's great because I know politics are not like everybody's forte. And I know a lot of people that just don't care. But I like what you said about, you know, getting involved in other things. I was looking at your uh, Facebook page and you seem really passionate about mental health. Do you Mm -hmm. have any like plans or ideas that you would you think would help improve the mental health crisis that we're in? Uh, Mental health is a big deal right now in in Utah. And uh, we're the nation's sixth largest or the sixth highest uh, rate of youth suicide in the country, which is really tragic. And especially where in so many other metrics, Utah is the top, right? Yeah. We're the top economy in the nation, lowest unemployment rate, all these, you know, the lowest percentage of children born uh, to a single parent and all these metrics, Utah scores really well. 
but in, in uh, youth suicide and depression and mental health, we have a ways to go. So we've been working on a lot of mental health initiatives at the state level. And um, it's been fun to work with people across the aisle on that because that really does cut across both Democratic and Republican lines to try to help our kids. One bill I sponsored this past session was HB 81, which was to allow mental health days for students. And right now, when you, your parent excuses you from school, there's a list in the state code of things you can be excused for, including you know surgery and physical illness and things like that. We added mental illness a few years ago, which is great. But this year with my bill, we added mental and behavioral health. And, and this is, there's a subtle difference between mental illness and mental health. Not all of us are mentally ill. Many people are and are struggling with a mental illness, but not all of us. But all of us have mental health, just like we all have physical health. We want to take care of our physical health and our mental health. So if you're a student and you are at the breaking point where to get up and go face another day at school, you just can't do it. Your parent can now legitimately, without shame, excuse you from school for mental health reasons. You don't need a doctor's no, it's just a parental excuse. Now, that doesn't mean you get out of a test or you don't have to make up the work down the road or those sorts of things. But if there's a day where you need to cry uncle, that's now allowed in state code. So we're looking at other ways to make little tweaks and helps on this very serious problem. That's fantastic. Yeah. When you talk about where we are positioned in relation to other states and that we're scoring you know, not as good. The question for me is why? And, you know, you may not be the, the person to ask on this, but what have you seen as contributing factors to the mental health crisis? So there's a, a number of things. Uh, this surprises some people, but actually the altitude is one factor. Those really? that live in higher elevation states tend to have higher rates of depression and suicide than those at sea level. It's a, an issue not only for Utah, but you look at the other ones that are really high and it's it's Colorado, it's Wyoming, it's Montana. Uh, so the, the elevation and altitude, strangely, is a factor. Another factor is I think sometimes in Utah, we have, we've put a lot of demands on ourselves. There's kind of this perfectionistic culture. And some of it, frankly, stems from, you know, we're under a lot of pressure to do good things and do the right things. And those can be good pressures, but we still kind of feel the pressure, don't we? And so it's important that we uh, make sure that we're not being too judgmental and too harsh on ourselves. The other thing we've seen nationally is a rise in youth suicides. It's a direct correlation with the rise in smartphone use. And, you know, they say comparison is the thief of joy. I think as a Mark Twain quote, comparison is the thief of joy. And what does social media do? The good news is it allows us to do a little show and tell and, hey, I was with this friend today, or I went to this party, or I got this haircut or whatever. But the bad news is you also imagine this perfect life that all your friends have that you don't have, and you only see the sunny side often in social media. And so there's been a real correlation between the rise of, of smartphone use and social media use with youth suicide and depression. Now, it's sad because none of us would give up our smartphones, Yeah. but we have to realize we tend to compare a lot. And if you have a little bit of mental illness or a little bit of mental health challenges, those comparisons can be exacerbated into some real anxiety and depression issues. Absolutely. That's really interesting. I I wouldn't think that like the actual like location of our state would have any impact on us, but yeah. Yeah. Hawaii wins for the happiest state and they're at sea level, well, palm Can you trees, blame them? <laughs> <laughs> um so what can we do? Not just as like citizens, because this this is gonna go out to people who's not just paradigm high schoolers. So what can we do as high school students, but also what can we do as your average Joe citizens of Utah to get involved with this and to make changes in our mental health here? You know, I think there's a lot of things that we can do on the small individual level as well to help with mental health. And there's a lot of little things that add up. Like they say that one thing I've heard is that overeating is the most overused way to cope. And exercise is the most underused way to medicate, self-medicate, right? And so there's this huge correlation between eating less and moving more that reflects on our happiness. And so that's one way is, is take care of yourself physically. You know, I, I have a, a, a son that's a, the junior class president at Granger High, and he was lamenting the other day how little sleep high school kids get. And besides newborns and the elderly, guess which group needs the most sleep? 
we do. <laughs> yeah. But how often do we stay up later than we should? Because you just want to binge that one more show or you're chatting with your friends on your phone. We all do it. And by the way, back before we had smartphones, we kind of did it too when I was in high school. What did you guys fill the time with? Well, I, I remember watching TV shows with my brothers and it's like, oh, we got to go to bed. And we even had to watch the commercials back then, you know. Wow. <laughs> Stone age. <laughs> Stone age. <laughs> but, uh, so, one, so one piece of advice is look for ways to take care of your physical self. And when I say exercise, you don't need to be a gym rat. I hate exercising. But guess what? I'll go on walks with my wife in the neighborhood. I'll, I'll walk with my daughter to church or look for ways to just move and be more active. I'll play pickleball with my son. You know, look for ways to move and be more active. Have the discipline to go to bed earlier. Work backwards on how much. OK, if I want to get eight hours tonight, I need to be in bed by this time. And it normally takes me this amount of time to wind down and get to bed. Work backwards. Don't. Don't run to fizz at 11 o'clock at night, you know, <laughs> bad idea. Call about. <laughs> okay. So one is, is look at your, your physical state. Cause that's going to affect mental. At number two, try to be kinder to people. Try to be less judgmental to people. We always think that we're the only ones that maybe had a rough day, but you have no idea what people around you are going through. And so to, to give people the benefit of the doubt, to be a little more patient with people, people you disagree with to disagree better. You know, don't have this scorn and enmity and eye rolling when you're talking to someone that's the opposite from you politically. Try to still be kind and friendly to people, value people. And so there's a lot of little things we can do to help ourselves, but also in our interactions with others that can affect your mental health. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Do you feel that it is our responsibility of citi as citizens to help create a better world? Do we have an obligation here in the United States? I do. And I think, you know, one of the great shocking, right? <laughs> we do have an obligation. But one of the, the philosophies I like the best comes from a Georgetown professor named Carol Quigley. And Dr. Quigley's view, he talked about future preference. And he said, any great society in human history makes hard decisions today so that it's better for people tomorrow. And as soon as you start doing the opposite, making selfish decisions today, which makes it easier today and harder tomorrow, then you start declining as a civilization. And he cites example of, from the Romans on of, you know, example after example that does it. Well, think about kind of the Utah ethos. We had pioneers come here in the 1800s and they would stop along the way in the plains of Iowa or Nebraska or whatever, and they would plant crops. Not that they would ever eat because they were moving on to Utah, but the other pioneer groups coming months later could then say, oh my gosh, there's food here for us already. They, they had some future preference. Now, the opposite of that is right now when we're spending trillions and trillions of dollars and the national debt is just exploding. And by the way, we have a spending problem on the left and the right, because under Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan and other Republican presidents, we spent too much as well. And we certainly are spending too much right now. Well, guess what that does? That makes us feel good right now when there's stimulus checks coming out. But guess who's going to have to pay for that someday? You guys, the young Me. people, <laughs> and your are. children, <laughs> and, uh, and my children's children, and their children's Along children, with our social security. <laughs> That's right. And so we're doing the opposite of future preference right now. So we have an obligation to be more like the pioneers planting planting trees that we'll never enjoy the shade of, but that down the road our kids and grandkids will enjoy the shade of. Right. Mm -hmm. We benefit by those who fought the Civil War and the Revolutionary War and the Civil Rights era. We're benefiting from that today. What are we doing today as people so that our kids and grandkids can have a better America? To answer that question, sort of with another question, I would ask, what do you feel is more important for us to be doing? Should we have a future preference towards creating more liberty for people or should we have a future preference for creating more equality amongst people? I applaud you for asking that question. And let me tell you why. I, I, I'm a Republican office holder. I represent a very purple district, right? Out in West Valley, uh, there's a lot of Democrats, a lot of Republicans, a lot of independents. And, and I've had my kids say, Dad, what, what's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat? But the answer, I, I try to really look at that objectively. But the real thing is this, the, the two words you asked, Alan, about liberty and equality, both are good American values, aren't they? Liberty and equality. But when approaching solving problems, Republicans tend to use liberty and, and protecting liberty as a higher value. And Democrats tend to use equality as a higher value at the expense of liberty. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and both are good American values. The problem is if the pendulum swings too far, if you go pure liberty and neglect equality, there is no safety net when you lose your job or when, you know, when you're mm-hmm. for the starving children or, or any of the t- tough situations. And it becomes a little bit of anarchy. There's no government regulation at all. If the pendulum swings too far on the equality, well, then you're in the communist China. You're in Soviet Union. You're in Cuba, where you don't get to choose the car you want or the house you want or the job you want. That's all decided by the government and the wealth is all redistributed that way. Well, that's no bueno either, right? So somewhere between there, those two extremes is where you want to be. As a Republican, I tend to tag more toward the liberty side. But again, that's not all the way to the right and ignoring the equality piece. So I would say, to make a, a short answer long, both liberty and equality are important. But boy, if you lose that liberty piece, you're in deep trouble. So to me, I, I are on the side of liberty. So with liberty and equality, we see that different states have chosen to respond differently to that question. Right. Favoring equality or favoring liberty. And we've seen a pretty massive shift from blue states to red states in terms of population. A lot of Californians moving here, Texas, Florida. What are your thoughts on the housing crisis that has begun since everyone started moving here from other states? And do we need to do anything about it? Well, because, sorry. No, you're good. Um, My concern and my parents' concern with the housing crisis is because they were talking to me a lot in preparation for, you know, recording this episode today. Their concern is that, you know, with people moving in, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, prices are inflating, people can't pay their rent, and so it almost seems like Utahns are kind of being forced out. And so, I don't know, we're just like in a difficult spot where we can't afford to stay, we can't really afford to go, like what, I don't know, what, what, what do we do? What do we do? What would be your response to the, to the housing situation right now? You know, I just came from a lunch with a few of us legislators with Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson, and I I told the Lieutenant Governor, I said, that the number one issue I'm hearing in my district right now facing Utah is the housing crisis. More than education, more than mask wearing, although people get worked up about that. (laughs) (laughs) We're, We're about done with that, thankfully. But the housing issue is real, and it becomes a supply and demand issue. Utah right now has 50,000 more households than we have houses. And as a dad with some kids that are getting older, I'm nervous on where they're going to live because I don't want it to be my basement. I'd rather them be able to get out there. And so the question is, how do we solve the housing crisis? My day job is I work for the city of Mill Creek as their economic development director and as assistant city manager. And here we're trying to balance that need for additional housing with preserving this good single family neighborhoods that we have. So we have a part of our city where we're trying to create a city center where we're going to have 75 foot tall apartment and condo buildings. And we're permitting those and encouraging those. And uh, yet we're surrounding that density. We're using the increment from that density to create an ice skating ribbon and a town plaza that all the residents can enjoy. So I actually think what Mill Creek is doing to increase the housing stock in a significant way is, is a very smart way because it's bringing in density and new households in a way that it helps. There's a lot of cities around the state where they're not permitting uh, new houses besides what can be on a big, large lot. And you hear people say, on the one hand, I don't know where my kids are going to live. And out of the next breath, they say, don't build that new apartment building next to my house or in my neighborhood. (laughs) Go build that in the other part of the valley. It's a very similar conversation when they were trying to decide where the prison should go. Everyone just sort of said, not close to me, please. Yeah. You see in government, a lot of NIMBYs, not in my backyard, and I am why. <laughs> and so that's become a real issue. It's really exacerbated now with the cost of steel. It's gone up. Uh, lumber's up 300% year over year. Glass and cement are even going up. And so it's getting more expensive to build a house. Now, we are seeing a big demographic shift in this country from blue states where people are tired of being overtaxed and overregulated to red states uh, where they're solving problems with more liberty. And that's why Utah and Texas and Tennessee and Florida are growing. But that realize the number one reason that we have additional households in Utah is still our large birth rate. It's our kids. Some of it's the Californians moving in. But if you were to look at a pie chart, that's a relatively small percentage compared to our own kids and grandkids. We are so good at having kids here in Utah. We're so good at having kids. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> we'll create responsibly. But yeah, good, good job, Utah. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, of course. <laughs> but we are. And so it becomes, I have four kids, right? I, I'm, I'm doing my part and they're going to need a place to live. So I think having cities allow more density is a, a big issue. So on allowing density in my neighborhood, as far as I understand it in West Valley, that they have allowed people who are running basement apartments to now come into the light and become legal. If I'm correct, I believe they passed like a bill or something where people can start renting out their basements more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Ava's right. There was an ADU bill, accessory dwelling unit. Basically, the state is requiring cities to allow that to some degree where if you've been renting someone's basement or whatever, it's okay. It's acceptable, right? So on my street, the people directly across from me have two tenants plus themselves. The people next to me have two tenants plus themselves. The people down the way have two tenants plus themselves. And the people who just moved in across from me are are putting in another basement apartment and then they're going to rent out their apartment and they're going to move because the parking got too bad because they put in too many apartments. And as much as I like to fare on the side of liberty, I feel like this increased density is creating sort of a surplus in populations. I was going to make the joke when you said that we had 50,000 more households than we did houses. I would say that they are all in my neighborhood. (laughs) (laughs) That's where they are, right? They're they're living somewhere. They're not just... I mean, some of it's homelessness, but most of it is doubling up, tripling up like your neighborhood. This is why West Valley City recently, I remember when I was mayor of West Valley, people would come and complain about that. They'd say, hey, there's all these multiple households living in one house, and I bought a home in a single family neighborhood for a reason. Well, with the federal fair housing laws, those are near impossible to enforce, right? Because if you're related at all, or you're friends at all, or whatever, you can kind of count as your household. And so the West Valley City approach has been, okay, we want to target then the negative effects of when you have multiple families in one home. And so that's why their code enforcement is extra vigorous. That's why West Valley City just passed an ordinance that's been kind of controversial this past month about parking. The parking within five feet of your own driveway? Yeah, because on the one hand, people are like, what? Why can't I just park? And the reality is it's like your neighborhood, Dallin. If If everyone gets blocking all the driveways and you can't safely back out of your driveway anymore, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. So there's, there is some pros and cons with that ordinance, by the way, but there's some merit to it. If you can actually back out of your driveway and get somewhere, then maybe it doesn't bother you so much if your neighbor has two households that they're in one house. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Great issues. You guys are smart there at Paradigm, digging in some real stuff. <laughs> hey, thank you. Going back a little bit to your early career, I assume that growing up, you probably worked at the dairy as a kid. I did. I ran the bottle washer, you know, with the milk Mm -hmm. and worked there in the milk plant as a kid. And uh, I also worked at Ambassador Pizza for a little bit as a kid. I was a pizza maker. Uh, They're out of business now. Oh, no. (laughs) R.I.P. Ambassador Pizza. Thank you. Rip. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Rip. (laughs) Uh, But my question there would be, how do you feel like working at a local business, especially a family-owned business like Winder Dairy, has helped shape your political perspective? Well, I mean, it it shaped my perspective because I've seen the side of the business owner. In his recent address to Congress, President Biden says, we need to have minimum wage be at least $15 an hour. Well, I've seen from the business owner point of view, if you make everything $15 an hour, then you're going to have a a pretty severe labor shortage because you won't be able to employ all the entry-level folks who aren't at $15. I'll give you an example. I was at Red Robin the other day with my family. They had plenty of open tables but they're not able to hire enough help right now. So they actually made you wait for quite a while before you got in. And then even once you're seated, the service was quite slow simply because they didn't have enough workers. Well, if you're a small business owner and you have 10 employees at eight bucks an hour, and all of a sudden the federal government requires you to pay 15 an hour, you can't afford to have that many employees. So you're going to lay people off. And that's why the Congressional Budget Office says, hey, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour actually reduces more jobs and creates more unemployment out there. And so I've seen working in a family business kind of that perspective of management, but I also know from working that you can't live forever on eight bucks an hour, 10 bucks an hour, but there's better ways to to solve that than to merely up the minimum wage and force people to comply. Because what you see is more McDonald's using kiosks instead of human beings, more grocery stores using self-checkout instead of checkout. Right. And that doesn't work for like family businesses. Like right. I I work for a family owned like custard shop diner and we already struggle enough with being understaffed because nobody wants to work food service first off. Right. And because, you know, they are family owned. And so they can only afford to 
employ so many employees. And so I could just see how if, you know, they raise the minimum wage from seven twenty five to fifteen dollars, how we'd lose most of our staff and probably be run out of business. At least the store that I'm I work at. So my question on that would be that I've heard from a lot of people who do want to um, or I've heard from a fair few people who do want to raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. Mm-hmm. That minimum wage is supposed to be the minimum livable wage that you could support yourself, get a house, get a car, or whatever it is that you need to do to like be surviving in America. Probably you don't need a car, but nevertheless, that it it would be like this this minimum livable wage. And their argument is that seven twenty five is not a livable wage. Where would your stance be on that? So I think it's some basic economics. Sometimes you can force things with the law, but the reality is it's just like the law of gravity. The law of economics can't be ignored and things are, there's going to be cause and effect for what you do. When someone goes in and they get a job that's at minimum wage, it's never designed that, hey, that's the job you should do your whole life. And that's what you're going to provide for your family on. What it is, is the minimum wage sorts of jobs are kind of your entry level wage jobs. And you as an individual have the responsibility to try to get some additional skills or, or degrees or certificates so you can move on to other jobs. There's been plenty of people who have, have started in minimum wage jobs that end up great CEOs because they have that entry level experience and then they work their way up and move on. And so to say that, hey, if you're flipping burgers in a at a McDonald's, you need to be that needs to be a livable wage that you can support a household on that. That sounds good, but the economics of it just don't work. What does work is to help get people some additional skills so they can advance to jobs that create more benefit to society and therefore justify a higher wage naturally without forcing it that way. How would you help people um, get those skills? Or like, What are some ways you think could help? So that's a great question, Ava. When you look at someone who's in high school, We need to do a better job of pounding the drum saying, all right, when you leave high school, you're not done. You need to go down one of three paths. Path number one is college and university. And kids have heard that forever. But guess what? That's not the right path for everyone. And there are plenty of great careers that aren't in the college and university path. But it is a path. Path number two is you should go to a technical college. You should go get some skilled trainings there. Davis Applied Technology College. They're turning out welders that are starting at $75,000 a year after a two-year program. My new son-in-law, Corey, he's graduating from Southwest Technical College in Cedar City next month with an auto mechanic certificate. Guess what? You can have all the philosophy majors in the world, but you're still going to need someone to fix your car. (laughs) What if I think about it really hard? I logic my way through it. (laughs) But then there's a third path that people don't always know about, and that's apprenticeships. And apprenticeships are different than trade tech and different than college and university. And one of the bills I passed uh, last year in last year's session was a bill to be the first state in the union to have a commissioner of apprenticeship programs. We have a commissioner of higher ed. We have a commissioner of technical colleges. Now we have a commissioner of apprenticeship programs. And what her role is, is she's coordinating and scouring the waterfront of all the great apprenticeship programs in Utah and making a one-stop shop in the Department of Workforce Services where kids come out of high school can find those. And these are great programs that your labor unions like the AFL-CIO and their affiliates are running or that the international building trades groups are running or the associate general contractors are running. And these are ones that teach you how to, everything from how to help with road construction work and run equipment to helping with pipe fitting and other construction sorts of trades. There are some great paying jobs where they pay you And at the end of the program, you have a a federally recognized certificate that's transferable. Most kids don't even know that path exists. If I was one of those kids, which I am, where would I go to find that list and to apply for these apprenticeships? Yeah, Google up Utah apprenticeship and you'll see something on the Utah Department of Workforce Services. And they have a whole page now on apprenticeships and you can click find apprenticeship. And these, these are some great programs that teach kids you earn while you learn, which which is a wonderful thing. Okay, this is pretty freaking cool. <laughs> it is. You don't have to have a four-year degree and a ton of college debt to make a living, but you do have to have some sort of skill or trade beyond your high school diploma where you can give back to, to society. And, and those guys are making the wages a lot higher than 
the fifteen dollar minimum Absolutely. wage proposal. Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll put this link on our Instagram for anyone who's listening who is interested in looking. Good. On this. this is fantastic. Great. It is really useful. Honestly, I'm on the Department of Workforce Services right now, and it says there are thirty nine thousand four hundred six jobs in my area, like different apprenticeships, and the requirements are you must be sixteen years or old and not be in another apprenticeship. And that's pretty cool. But there are some great things and that's worth poking through because we all need to find what we want to do and how we're going to make a living, right? And college and university is a great path for many, but it's not going to be the right path for all. And thank goodness, because we do need people to fix our cars and build our roads. And we talk about the housing crisis. Part of that's a labor shortage. Absolutely. There are so many different factors. Okay. What else do you guys want to talk about? These are some great issues, by the way. Uh, I want to talk about COVID. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I've heard of it. <laughs> it's really crazy. Yeah, it's like this new stuff. I don't know if I have. Uh, maybe. maybe. So uh, in Utah, I remember when there was a statewide mass mandate for all state and federal buildings. I hope you remember. It was like two weeks ago. I think no, no, four, no, no, three no, weeks ago. Like a month ago. It was like near the beginning. Th- those are the days. When will we see a full repeal of the mask mandate statewide? All right. So we hit the metrics this week where the mask mandate statewide is gone except for k through 12 yeah and even that is gone at the end of this school year but the reason of that makes some sense i'll give you an example in my family everybody's vaccinated except for my 13 year old grace and hopefully once the pfizer vaccines approved for young people in the next week or two she'll be able to get hers as well but in her they're, they're saying that in that age group they're seeing huge transmission still of COVID. there was a case in jordan school district two weeks ago where one of the junior highs decided to do their school musical without masks and without testing. You know, the whole test to play that sports and arts supposed to do. They didn't do that. They thought, ah, we'll be okay. They had an outbreak of 40 students in this one junior high wow. two weeks ago. Well, guess what? Young people, when they get it, they're not going to get that sick. It's not that serious for young people. The problem is this. Young people can spread it. I have a neighbor who's in the hospital with COVID on a ventilator fighting for his life. And my 13 year old says, I'm going to still wear my mask at school till the end of the school year so that we don't spread it around at school and therefore take it home to your neighborhood and get your neighbor sick. And so I know we all hate masks. I know we're sick of them, but we're two weeks away from school being over. So hang tight and let's keep doing the testing as you need to do wearing your mask. We'll get through this. I really feel like the end is in sight here because boy, it feels (laughs) great to be vaccinated. I went to spring break for Texas, flew in an airplane, wasn't worried. When people come to my office, we don't wear masks if we're both vaccinated. No worries. We're good. I guess I would assume then you are you are pro-vaccine for your stance on that. If you look at his Facebook page, definitely. Yeah, my, my stance is this. Number one, I encourage everybody to get vaccinated. I believe that they're safe. I believe that, they're wor- that they work. I believe that they're the ticket to get beyond COVID. That said, I also believe it's a personal health decision. And if someone chooses for whatever reason to not be vaccinated, that's their choice. I, I uh, co-sponsored a bill with Representative Spenlove that said in the state of Utah, we cannot require vaccines as a government. Now, your private business may require it, or an airline might require it, or I'm hearing some of the cruise lines that are opening up that's saying, hey, you can't come on the ship unless you're vaccinated. That's their right as a private business to require. But as government, we're not going to require people to be vaccinated. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that is a fantastic bill. I think that's a lot of what at least most people who are hesitant about vaccines is that not only do they feel that the vaccine might be unsafe, but that they will be forced to take it whether they want to or not. And in other states, that might become a reality, but not in Utah. But not in Utah. Yes. Because we care about liberty, right? And I think that (laughs) sets a precedent that's a very important precedent that we are not going to force you to put a vaccine in your body that you don't want to put in it. And that's going to apply to not just COVID, if anything happens in the future. Right. We're not that far off from a point where businesses will quit requiring masks. Many already have. We'll be out of school. There's going to be no masks in school this fall. And there's a point where it's like, guys, you can walk into your CVS and get vaccinated if you want to, or you can roll the dice. It's your choice. And there's going to be people literally get sick and die that don't get vaccinated and there's going to be plenty of people that are just fine because they have a good immune system and it doesn't hit them that hard but that should be an individual choice why do you think people are so scared that like the government is going to force us or try to force us to get vaccinated why do you think that's a fear well i think it's a a function of a couple things one is whenever the government tells you you should do something 
there's immediately a number of people who will blanch at that and say, no, I don't want my government telling me what to do or making me do something. Um, and so part of it's just the, the suspicion of, oh, if the government, if Big Brother wants me to do this, I better not do it. But then there's another part where I've heard people say, hey, this vaccine was created a lot quicker than most other vaccines that we use. This is different than polio vaccine that I've used for 50 years or whatever. I'm a little bit nervous. I don't want to be a guinea pig. Let's sit back and see. I've talked to enough uh, medical professionals that I don't personally have that fear at all, but I respect if someone has that fear. It's your body. You know, the whole thing, my body, my choice, as some say, that should be true with vaccines too. Uh, so I think that's where some of the fear is. And part of it's just educating people that, hey, vaccines aren't going to kill you. They're going to be what prevents this uh, virus from spreading. It's crazy because the founders and citizens created the legislature to tell us what to do. And well, we're, we're sort of like afraid of that happening. Yeah. But on the other hand, the founders created the legislatures and Congress to protect us from the liberties we have or to, to help preserve the liberties that we have, I should say. Yeah, I agree with I agree with Rep. Winder there. I don't think that the legislature was, you know, created so we can be governed. I think it was created so that we're ensuring our rights are protected. And that's, you know, where like the checks and balances come in with the with the three branches of government. It's all it's all a fail safe so that we maintain our rights and maintain our liberties. And that's really what their job is. It's not to tell us what to do, I would I would say. But there's a balance like that. When you're in a health pandemic that's killing three million people around the world, you know, does the government have a right to put in different some restrictions? They do, at least on the books right now but boy there's a lot of people that were sure upset when mask mandates came out and social distancing and whatnot i'm just glad that utah's handled it better than most states if you i looked at a graph the other day that showed by state how many people per capita have died of covid and then on the other axis it was how many jobs per capita were lost during covid and guess who is in the worst quadrant new york they lost the most right. jobs and had the most die per capita guess who's in the best quadrant utah Utah. Um, not to like backtrack too much, but I remember what I was going to say about mass mandates for like the protecting of the health of communities and stuff and how like it is within legislative power to do that, at least of what we understand now. And it made me wonder if the people that, you know, fight against it or people who fight for it, either side, like review the documents like the Utah Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. So <laughs> that being said, my question for you is how often do you feel like you review should review the Utah Constitution or the U.S. Constitution? Like how important to you is it and how, how familiar do you have to be with it to be in your position? Well, I think you have to be very uh, in tune with those because when you're sworn into office, you raise your hand to defend the Constitution of the United States and the state of Utah. And so uh, and we're probably not, not only office holders, but citizens derelict in reviewing those documents enough. I'll confess I'm more familiar with the U.S. Constitution than the Utah Constitution because you start studying that in AP government and even younger, right? Right. But, but those documents are critical. In every bill we write, our drafting attorneys make sure it's constitutional and, and, and check with that. And we, we want to make sure we always color within the lines of those important documents. That's what makes America different when it was formed versus every other country in the world is there were some guardrails for government to not veer too off, too far and too crazy. So the constitution does matter. Yeah, absolutely. How can we get more people to engage with these documents at a level of studying? Most of my peers have read the constitution and I think that's a lot to do with like the school that we're in. And it's just such a central text to America and it's so interesting to see how many people here aren't very familiar with it. And so my question would be how can you or how can we help get the average high school student to pay more attention to the constitution of both the United States and the state constitution and get them more involved and um, meeting their civic duties? I don't know. It's a difficult question. No, it, it is. <laughs> it's yeah. a very difficult question. And not only that, but people often don't understand the branches of government, but even the different levels of government. For instance, I, I mentioned my wife, Karen, is president of the Grant School Board. Mm -hmm. they, they had on their, at their board meeting Tuesday night, a group of 50 people show up to, to boo, jeer, and shout down anyone that would speak. And then they came up after the public comment period and wanted to yell at the board about mask mandates at the school board meeting, the Grant School Board meeting. And there's a few reasons why this was crazy. One, they sent them, the leaders, how to sign up for the public comment period, and only one did. They were allowed to speak. 
And so they were mad they didn't get to speak. Number two, masks weren't even on the agenda that night. Number three, this mask mandate that they're mad about in schools wasn't decided at the school district level. It's at the governor's level. Go yell at him if, if, the, if you don't want that. Don't come yell at your school board. <laughs> and then number four, we got two more weeks of school left, right? So tough it up, people. But it struck me how people sometimes get mad and frustrated and they don't have the civic knowledge to even know which group to go address. People will be mad about something in Washington, D.C. and email me as a local legislator about it. That 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 whole scene you described with the, the school board meeting feels like a, a scene out of Parks and Recreation. It was very Parks and Rec. <laughs> it's, it's been insane. They had to unplug the microphones. They adjourned the meeting early. The crazy... The, People who were upset ran up and took the school board seats and said, we're the school board now. It's like a mini insurrection. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Tuesday night past week. <laughs> and now some people are going to be pressed with charges of uh, disturbing the peace and, and public nuisance and some of those things, I guess. But people confuse, well, the Constitution says I have the freedom of speech. Doesn't that mean I can walk into any meeting anywhere and yell at you? No, no that's not what that means. Not. There's still an order to things in a democracy, right? So... That paradigm, I feel like the the Constitution is a central text to our curriculum as well. Which is awesome, by the way. Yeah, I, I really have enjoyed it. Seniors at Paradigm are required to write like a 10-page thesis. It's extensive, but I wrote a lot of it on the Constitution, and we were talking through it yesterday, and some research I'd found from the Annenberg Public Policy Center, which is, I think it's the Philadelphia University or something like that, but they do a survey every year, and only 51% of the people they surveyed, which was 1,000 people, could name all three branches of government. Just the three branches, not the right, not the rights for the First Amendment, just right. the three branches of government. And does that concern you at all as like an office holder? <laughs> does that make you nervous that a lot of these people in America don't even know what they're doing? It does. Thomas Jefferson said, the greatest antidote to tyranny is an informed electorate. And if the <laughs> electorate's not informed, that's scary because then they just go on whatever... They, they believe lies that people running for office may say. They believe crazy things that their neighbors shared on Facebook. They, they don't really understand what, what's going on in America and how it works. I feel like my new mission is to put that quote on a poster here at Paradigm. That is fantastic. This is sort of a joke, but also sort of very, very serious. I want a test to be able to vote in America. And if you can't at least have some sort of civic knowledge then you don't get to choose who the next president is. Well, what's interesting is we do have a test. We have a civics test that we have to take every year. I'm taking it on Monday, Mm -hmm. or not every year, sorry. Seniors have to take it in order to graduate high school, and people and immigrants have to take it in order to become U.S. citizens. Do you have to graduate high school in order to vote for the president? Well, that's the thing. If you want to graduate high school, you have to pass this test. Yet, so we're seeing all these graduates obviously pass the test that does does that mean they know what they're doing? And the question is, do we make the test harder and have less high school graduates? Or do we keep the same, have a lot of high school graduates and have people voting who don't know what they're doing? Well, and it comes back to that liberty question, right? Think of one of the biggest responsibilities you ever do as a human being, which is to have kids. But is there a license to have children to procreate? Do you have to pass a test first? Because I know a lot of parents who would probably flunk that test. Heck, maybe I would sometimes, <laughs> but... But, you know, think about that. But sometimes there's just fundamental things in society that's your right to do as a free human being. And I think voting is that way, too. Do I wish the electorate was more informed? Absolutely. And civics education is critical. But I would never require somebody to have to pass a test to vote because that get, can be manipulated by nefarious forces. And now all of a sudden you're denying liberty to the people, which is kind of a sacred fundamental thing, I think. Well, that is fantastic. We will wrap up on that. Yeah, we're out of time, but we really appreciate you talking with us today, Rep. Winder. We ask our guests at the end of every episode if they have one thing they'd like to challenge people to go out and do or to take away from this episode. So if you would like to give us something, a challenge. So my, my challenge is this. Learn to disagree better. Don't always agree with your friends and your parents and your neighbors. That's okay. It's okay to have disagreement, but do it without contempt. Disagree with people and still love them. Don't lose friendships over it. Don't get all personal in a disagreement with somebody. Don't be afraid to disagree, but disagree better. That'd be my challenge. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. 
Thank you guys so much for listening today. I hope you guys got just as much out of this as we did. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at the Paradigm Pod. If you have any suggestions, comments, or just want to talk to us, email us at podcast at paradigmhigh.org. Don't forget to rate us five stars and leave a review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Get out there and disagree with each other respectfully. Thank you.